great mics. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. With the blue light, that's like a, kind of the new version. I don't like the blue mic though. It's I the know. light. Blinding <laughs> my eyes. I know. It's really Nobody ridiculous. needs to see that. And if I leave it on at night, like sometimes you know you leave your, you just leave the room and you come back and there's like this weird blue light in your room and you're like, what is? Oh, it's the freaking. So these are the what we call the Chinese Buddha, like mm-hmm. in Chinese, oh, cool. it's called Guanyin, and there are definitely some religious aspect of these figures, but they're known all over Asia and they're interpreted very differently. And they look female, but some of them are actually of male figures. Many people don't know that. How's it going, Gareth? How you, my boy? Great, guys. <laughs> How's it going, my man? Are you, brother? Yes, I'm flipping great, my man. How about you? Yeah, but I'm also awesome. I'm, uh, I had a great weekend and I'm really excited about the chat that we have this week uh, with Fei Wu. Uh, Faye was an amazing guest and a little bit about Faye. Uh, first and foremost, I would say that Faye is like a really good friend of mine um, who I've got to know over the last few months, thanks to a podcasting mastermind, which she set up. Faye is definitely a smart, talented, charismatic go-getter. And she grew up in Beijing, China and left when she was 17 years old to go to America on an international high school program. She has always been encouraged to be herself by her parents who were a little non-traditionalist. Uh, Faye these days lives in Boston. Uh, she is a bilingual podcaster and speaks English and Mandarin Chinese. Faye is an entrepreneur with a focus on helping small businesses grow. And her speciality is freelance digital marketing and project management. Faye is also a third degree black belt in Taekwondo. And in her spare time, she really enjoys calligraphy and dancing. But above all, Faye is a connector of people. And in the chat, we got onto some really interesting topics. Hey, Craig. Uh, Yeah, indeed, Gareth. We discussed the academic pressures placed on pupils within China. Also, some of the differences in the schooling system in the U.S. compared to China. The challenges of being a 17-year-old in a new country and exploring all number of new things. What it's like to live in the forbidden city and to eat the special fruits that the empresses used to consume back in the day. Why China is a great place to look to do business in the future why and how to run a mastermind. And we also got into the importance of your tribe in creating a movement. We also discussed how to overcome some of the challenges of being a solopreneur and a freelancer like Faye is. And finally, we chatted about her exciting upcoming documentary that she's busy with at the moment. And today, we also just wanted to get onto a little bit of housekeeping as we hadn't really done a housekeeping in some time I guess so I was just wondering how things are coming along with your future proofing coaching Craig uh, thanks for asking yeah it's coming along really well I've actually gone through a rebranding exercise based on a book that I read recently and it's really helped me focus on niching up with my coaching so there's a lot going on there I feel like much more comfortable with what I am actually doing going forward and i I'm just about to get into my stride and uh, it's, uh, it's great. I got a few clients now, which is awesome. And I got a coaching course coming out too in the not too distant future, which uh, is just, it just feels great. And uh, you also got some cool things going on, haven't you? Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, we've been on this sort of similar journey for a little while and I've been super inspired by yourself and one or two other friends. And uh, I've cut down on my work hours at the moment, actually two full days uh, and so that I can focus more on my offering as well. So that's in the pipeline. So very, very exciting. And uh, obviously, um, this joint venture that we're on with this awesome podcast of ours, and it's still our baby. We're still loving it so much. And but it's fun to also mention to a few other little things. So things are going really well. We're, we're really excited. So it's just good to just catch up on those things again as well. So um, you also had a few ideas of. Uh, things that people can do if they're enjoying our podcast. 
Yeah, for sure. Well, firstly, I just want to say I'm really proud of you. So well done for making such big changes. It's uh, thanks, it's, man. It, it's very, very sort of inspirational. So well done, but thanks, buddy. Likewise. Just in terms of yeah, I, the podcast. So if people want to hear a bit more about it and you know get weekly updates, if you go to our website, which is www.redick-human.com, you can sign up to our weekly newsletter where we send out updates on upcoming podcasts and we're also going to start posting our first few blog articles which is a nice sort of shift for us and change for us and then I guess in terms of this chat there was something that was really interesting for us which was the intensity of school in China and how getting good marks is so important you know Faye talks about getting 97 out of a hundred and that's almost like a failure. And I'm like, well, in South Africa, <laughs> if you got 70, that was still considered like a B and to be okay, you know? And, <laughs> um, one, one example from when I was a kid, I remember I'd done two years of science and at the end of the two years, my science teacher called me up like after class and she was like, Gareth, um, let's have a quick look at your science book. And uh, so I took it out and she's Gareth, well, you've got your front page filled in and the rest of it's empty. And that's, it's been two years of science now. Um, <laughs> I think you should consider taking an, another class for your final year of school because you're bringing down the class average. <laughs> so, and I was like, yes, ma'am, I agree. I should. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And you also had like some, interesting story when it came to science as well didn't you Craig some challenges <laughs> yeah, man. I think you and I were way more focused on probably just hanging out with mates and and playing sport and things like that you know but yeah same with me I I cruised through science uh hadn't I was lucky enough to not really have to study too much of things but I I just kind of scraped by and didn't really focus and then I went to university and first year chemistry and physics was uh, really tough all of a sudden I was like I realized that I hadn't listened at all I hadn't you know and it wasn't it just wasn't a game anymore you know like school was a bit of a joke and I realized like you know listening to Faye it's just um, the, the pressures that are placed uh, are, are like that no one would ever allow that to happen just to kind of little cruise by you know and and so it is really remarkable the, the kind of um, the long days that they even had at school, like the finishing school in the evening and then still doing tutoring and night classes after a full day. I was like, geez, you, you and I would have uh, definitely struggled. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think uh, at the end of the day, this is really a good time to, to take a moment and we're going to get into our awesome chat that we had with Faye and hear what makes uh, Faye Wu ridiculously human. Waking at dawn. Cool stuff. Well, good afternoon there, Fei Wu from Boston, Massachusetts. How's it going? How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Gareth and Craig. I feel like I've known you guys forever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we had a nice little chat just leading up into getting into this conversation, and it's. Uh, I often feel like some of the good stuff is even in those little pre-chats. Hey. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I'm I'm an open book and let's have some fun. For sure. Great. So how's your day been anyway today? It's Friday. Has you got anything going on special on a Friday? Yeah, uh, typically on Fridays, I, I start my day with a pretty early mastermind group at 8 a.m. with a, a few folks from uh, LTMBA, uh, cool. which was created by Seth Godin. I really, I just threw a bunch of words, probably didn't make sense to everybody. And um, it's my early day and I usually have a couple of client meetings and sometimes I go um, dancing at noon. It's, I'm taking a class or in this case today, knowing that this is happening, I'm actually going to um, work out in the evening. Um, but that's definitely part of the routine. And I know that and I learned from both of you through your podcast and your personal lives that fitness and, and keeping a healthy body will really inform a healthy mind. So yeah, yeah. that's for sure. What sort more. of, what sort of dancing are you doing? So it, it's uh, I've never been a dancer in my life. It's something I feared very much. So, uh, so it's called, it's a Zumba class, but there's a lot of 
hip hop, some Zumba, you know, Latin Americans and a mix of all of the above. And it just a lot of really good music, good energy from the room. And I am totally obsessed. I've been doing this pretty much like six times a week. Wow. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Sometimes twice a day, like yesterday. Wow, Whoa. that's cool. <laughs> so you hit like a, a lunchtime session and then again in the evening or something like that? Exactly. That's exactly what happened yesterday. Wow. Cool. And, and how many brilliant. people in the class have two left feet? <laughs> <laughs> I just learned. See, speaking of me being an immigrant, I never heard of that saying until very recently. And I thought the guy was... <laughs> like serious i was like i'm so sorry for you why do you have to uh, how do you buy shoes so sorry carry on and so okay. yeah you're you're saying how many people are non-professionals i would say most of them but they're every once in a while you do get these killer dancers and you wonder why they're there but they're always up front they're serious some ballet dancers as well um, you can sort of figure out their orig the origins of their of them being a dancer, and um, it's it's fascinating. So why is it important for a freelancer, which we'll get into a bit later, to actually make time to do some exercise? Oh my God, it's the number one thing because mm -hmm. when I started freelancing three years ago, nearly three years ago, my I've always been very active in my life, even though I did non-traditional sports because whatever was offered in school, I just wasn't necessarily good at, you know? Um, so I had to kind of choose my own thing and stay fit. And um, as a freelancer, when I started three years ago, I was so focused on getting more clients, making more money. And there was a little bit of an anxiety to start off very quickly. I realized that I was working 50, 60 hours a week, more so than when I had a full-time job. And so thrilled about the amount of cash I was making and I realized I was sacrificing my health for the reasons I was justifying. I said, oh, if I hit the gym, if I go to the movie, it's this amount of money that I'm missing out on. Mm -hmm. And um, it, very quickly I realized I couldn't possibly enjoy my lifestyle if I continue to, to do it that way. And mm -hmm. I'm in my 30s now and I put my body through a lot in my 20s work, work, work. So um, I think it's the number one thing I tell all the freelancers and the full-time employees that they have to make time for exercise. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. It just, it's just clears your mind, doesn't it? You just, you need that break and you need those endorphins to kind of carry you through the rest of the day as well, you know, especially because it can be stressful being, or it is stressful being a freelancer and working for yourself. For sure. And uh, I, you know, before I started dancing, I was a swimmer and there's something so liberating about burying your head under the water. You can't really do much of anything. You can't even have a conversation and fake exercise, right? Hang out with your friends and you're not really doing anything. And uh, I, I love that aspect, but I'm a huge fan of the new gym. Um, this is, I'm not affiliated with them, but I go to Lifetime now, Lifetime Fitness. And um I did it because my mom was visiting, but what I didn't realize was very quickly, I love sauna and I love, like, I love non-traditional medicine, uh, as you can imagine, healing through food and all these funky little things. So I love sitting in <laughs> the steam room, sauna, jacuzzi, and after I go dancing or weight training, it just, it, it's amazing. And I know it's a luxury and it's a, you know, sort of a <laughs> privilege to do that. Uh, that's cool. I think it, I mean, I think, yeah, lots of people that go to the gym, I mean, you know, it doesn't matter that gyms are not even that expensive these days as well. And you do get those saunas and the other sort of add on. So um, I guess we're all kind of a bit privileged these days with, you know, the prices of gyms and the fact that they have those. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, so, so you quickly, just before we move on, uh, you know, just to a bit more of your story, you just mentioned a mastermind there. So I guess a lot of people are not even aware of what a mastermind is. Can you just maybe give us a brief overview and then also talk about maybe how they run and what yeah. your might be about? 
Sure. I think it's really fascinating to talk about this because I'm sure you both belong to certain groups and Gareth and, and I belong to one of the, the same mastermind groups. So there's definitely an official definition. And in general, mastermind groups is a group of like-minded people, but often it is started and facilitated by someone, um, you know, a leader of the group that gathers the, the group of people, but most importantly, to ensure that the culture is good and it still fits even if you recruit more people, when old people leave. And um, the topics vary drastically in the market today. There are a lot of mastermind groups started by very famous, very known people uh, as a gateway for you to ask them questions, connect with them personally. And um, the mastermind groups that I belong to, which are two of them, uh, the one on Friday is a very casual catch up and we don't have a very strict structure, only five to six people. And we keep each other accountable and we help each other solve problems of the week. So uh, there is that love of urgency um, in terms of, you know, what we run into with our clients. Uh, I throw questions and struggles I have with my documentary, uh, whatever projects you have going on. The other uh, mastermind group that Gareth is very familiar with is what we call the alt podcasters, which stands for alternative podcasters, those who are not just in it to make money, to market, but also those who really want to hone in on their crafts and who make podcasts like this, who uh, your primary goal is to connect with real people and share their stories. Um, so the structure of, um, of that, uh, I try to keep it light, but the structure may also change over time. Right now uh, is that we'll have a speaker, a primary speaker, during that one hour to speak for about 20 minutes. Then we'll begin uh, some of the questions. And uh, Gareth has been the latest guest uh, in that mastermind group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so, it's so Faye, what, why is it so important? Like, why should someone try and find a, a mastermind? And, and like, how can that actually help you with your business or with your life or whatever the purpose is? Yeah, I think finding the right mastermind group sometimes takes time and it's really important because it could also backfire. Um, what you want to do is surround yourself with like minded people who are we are there for you. And what I mean by that, it's not necessarily colleagues or family members or friends, uh, people you conveniently uh, you know, associated by proximity to pull together. And sometimes that can actually be problematic. Um, I love what when Lisa Guida wrote this article is what to do when you outgrow your current community. That's exactly when mastermind groups will come into play, that you should mm -hmm. seek them out and um, so I think it really helps. I think the humanity plays a huge part that I think at all times, the people in culture, uh, always trump the, you know, sort of the structure and strategy is what I figure out through just a couple of years of mastermind group experience. Um, so when you feel that people truly care for you and I use the example of, um, the colleagues at your full-time job, you're trying to please, trying to get along, but there's always that mm -hmm. friction. And you realize when you go to go grab drinks or do something that you're somehow not included, you know, that feeling that politics is always going on in most people's mm -hmm. lives before they go home. But I think for mastermind groups, as an example, when I was in uh, New York, Helena drove an hour and a half from Connecticut to have brunch with us. And I think uh, you know, it says something. I know Gareth and, and, and Craig will do that for each other after the recording yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, of course. So, Definitely. So let's move on a little bit. You've got a, a really interesting story, right? And you've actually been sharing your story a little bit more now. And what we, what I've picked up is that a lot of your story begins with uh, when you left uh, China as a 17 year old girl. So mm. basically what makes a successful 17 year old girl, Chinese girl leave her home country? What, what is that? What was the trigger? What, what was my motivation at the time? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so 
in this is this was by the way uh nearly 18 years ago not to reveal my age and, but it's like that's interesting like half of my life in china the other half in the u.s and that's what kind of intrigued me for the documentary um at the time and i actually found out it's still the case that we go through 11 years of education uh, at that point for me as 17 and the final year when we're 18 all the school kids um all 12th grade is to prepare you for college so for that entire year not only it's e extremely stressful is that you spend that year to re basically review all the information all the things that you've learned uh, chinese math english physics chemistry and that entire year is to prepare you for sort of the chinese sat so at the time i realized that i part of me always knew i wanted to travel abroad and I also really wanted to avoid that year of just relearning everything. So I thought that's a perfect opportunity. Now, if I could do it again, if my parents had the money or financial means for it, I would have left a little one year earlier so, mm -hmm. that, so that I don't show up in the U.S. And two months later in November, you know, September, November, I have to actually compete in the U.S. SAT which most of the tests did not make sense to us whatsoever. Wow. So, so tell us, we've heard stories, you know, about the schooling system in China. It's pretty full on, uh, you know, and the hours and the, the pressures. What, a, what was it like to, to be a student uh, in, in China? Yeah, it is really hard to imagine <laughs> until you are there. And it is absolutely brutal. And um, from what I can remember, my mom had all these emotional moments after I left China and she was cleaning the house. And she says she gathered my paperwork, my notebook, my exams. It was taller than she is. She's 5'3". She's <sighs> so she said her hands hurt while trying to shred things. I mean, I'm like, mom, just buy a shredder already. And <laughs> <laughs> so... It, it is really tough, but the, I guess what, how it felt to be a Chinese student uh, studying and living in the US is that certain subjects came so easy to us that I, not that it because, not that I felt I was fitting in because you don't want to be a nerd or uh, mm. have too good of grades, even though I did. Um, <laughs> you're, you're just like I should probably get some of the math problems wrong so that other people <laughs> find me more relatable <laughs> so I could make more friends um, it was um, but actually it, it satisfies part of your ego because when you show up in the US a lot of other things don't work out well such as sports or trying to be tall. I'm just naming different things randomly mm. right now. We're, we're trying to fit in as the standard beauty when, you know, like my high school anyway, it was still the blonde, blue eyed, the, you know, <laughs> um, mm. you, don't, you know, but the just school alone, uh, going through, you know, math, physics, you feel like, well, you know, you got that under control. There's, there's a lot of pride in that. So that felt good. Mm. Yeah. Challenges. <laughs> and, and when did you learn to speak English? Was it part of your curriculum at school in China? It was, but we, we call it, we call it sort of deaf or we call it mute English because you literally learn for years and you can't speak a word and you freeze. We started, I started learning English um, officially in sixth grade and sixth or seventh grade and it was a it's a major thing i mean you go to college having to go through all these english exams and you have to pass otherwise you're not going to college hmm. so but yet for many many years most chinese people can speak because we can only read and write um uh, for me the benefit is the fact that my my mom as an artist, as you can see in the back, had a lot of students traveling from all over the world coming to China just to see her. She always had a translator. And when she was busy working, I remember being just like, we always stayed in hotels for many years during the summer. And uh, she would leave me with, you know, somebody else's kids, approximately my age, and all the kids only spoke English. So... Mm -hmm. 
my English was on and off, but I went to a regular Chinese school, to be clear. Like, my English was only sort of on during winter and summer vacation. <laughs> so your mom, you just mentioned her, um, is quite a, 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 an impressive lady. Her artwork is beautiful. She worked in a sort of an academic setting as well. Did your parents put a lot of pressure on you to be a good student? Not at all. In fact, they put too little pressure on me. Uh, I... <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, I grew up partly in, with my grandparents who were extremely strict until I was uh, in about fourth grade. And then I came home when I was in fifth grade. And I've always, I'm, I was one of those kids who put a lot of pressure on myself. I mean, looking back, I realize I, I try to be more relaxed, but there's also always that intense part of me um, mm. that I couldn't even lie about. I just, I always want to be that super chill and like so cool, <laughs> that type of person. And um, my parents recognized that, especially my mom. And um, she was so, she was called so westernized, meaning she was so anti tiger mom. Uh, she made our neighbors and people feel really uncomfortable, in fact, that <laughs> she didn't push me to study the piano. Instead, she sent me to play ice hockey and here's a skateboard. Wow. Do whatever you want. Be a powerful woman. And, cool. um, and in, when it comes to school, I, you know, in China, it's true that A- minus is Asian F right? <laughs> it's really fascinating. I remember I, I was really good in English classes and, and I would get like a 97 out of 100 on my exam. But in China, you're supposed to say, oh, where did those three points go? Why couldn't you do better? Oh, wow. It, wow. Literally. And my mom, and then you're supposed to bring that paper home, and the exam home, and then you will have your parents sign their name right next to the score. It can be at the bottom. Good like, Lord. So they see it. And um, so I, I, uh, after my mom signed one of my papers, I refused to have her sign future papers uh, because she <laughs> didn't know how to be politically correct. Correct. I had 97. She wrote down, dear Faye, I am so proud of you. And you were, I mean, and the second day I have to hand it back to the teacher. Oh, um, man. Oh, that's uh, funny. That's, that's <laughs> crazy. Seriously, when I was at school, if I got like 70%, I was like, I was like, yeah, yes. I did pretty well. I think even, I think 70 is still counted as a B in South Africa, actually. Yeah. <laughs> that was always, wasn't it? That's awesome. <laughs> so oh, you that's 70 great. being okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, so you mentioned you spent uh, quite a bit of your time living with your grandparents. Was there any particular reason for that? So, my mom now considers it as a huge mistake um, because both my parents were really into their careers. In particular, my mom didn't really take a traditional housewife sort of role. Um, she apparently revealed that when I was three years old, she asked me if I wanted her to be a very successful female and mother, mm -hmm. and, or did I want her to stay at home? I do not remember being asked that question. <laughs> That's an amazing thing to ask your three-year-old. As a three-year-old, I said, do you have it recorded? I mean, can I answer that question again 30 years later? <laughs> Apparently, I said I wanted her to be independent and I would want to admire her. I want to be like her when I grow up. As a result of her travel as an artist uh, around the world, I was sent to my grandparents' home, which is also in Beijing, about 40 minutes away. So in between her job and our home. So um, that, that's sort of why. So for, for many years as a result, I had this friction with my dad to think that if mom had to travel, why couldn't you raise me? I couldn't you do something about I'm the only child. There's no excuse. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and so just quickly about Beijing, like what was it like when you grew up there? Do you remember much? Like, cause it's obviously changed so much over the yeah. years, hasn't it? Yeah, Beijing is unrecognizable. In fact, I find it really strange when I go back nearly every year now, every couple of years, there are many areas and things I just wouldn't recognize. My friends will take me to new bars and bubble tea places, shopping malls. I'll be like, when did this thing happen? Because it wow. never looked like a six months a year project. Um, but when I was growing up, 
I loved living there and it just felt like a place of tradition, which a lot of foreigners or travelers don't know. Everybody seemed to want to go to Shanghai. That's always like their first destination. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of expats there, but Beijing is an interesting, phenomenal place. And the government has a lot of rules of not taking down, touring down all these old places. So you can go to these very old uh, Beijing spots where actually where I grew up in, uh, near my grandparents' house. And uh, it's it just nothing like what it is today. Um, wow. Yeah, any, it's, ask, feel free to ask me any specific question. I try not to ramble on for too long. So. No, that's good. I actually did have a specific question just briefly about school again. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned sport earlier. And I mean, there's some amazing uh, sort of Chinese athletes and that kind of thing. But how does sport fit into your school day? Because it's such an intensive sort of academic program. Where do you like fit in some playtime and sport? It really doesn't fit. Um, so is that question towards like how it fits to other kids and what part of our curriculum or how did I make it happen for myself? Um, well, I guess a bit of both, but yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, I, I always draw these really interesting and funny stories, like the, why, the ways that you thought about your own grades. Um, so we, so P, P, e, is that with PT or PE class uh, were part of our grades. So you can mess around. Like, mm -hmm. oh, <laughs> you yeah. can be uh, chubby, not athletic, and still expect to graduate with good grades. Um, so we, the school had a system where they make you run for like two, three miles in between your lunch, like during your lunch break or before <laughs> you leave school. <laughs> um, and, and Beijing has a pretty rough climate too. It's very, it's like New York slash Boston and it will snow during the winter. It's very, very cold during the winter time. So that's kind of how we made it happen. There were a couple of PE classes a week where it's very structured there may be 20 minutes for basketball a little bit of something else um in terms of how i had to figure it out for myself is because i i'm i'm five four and at the time it was probably 100 110 pounds i couldn't uh, you have to be very elite because chinese schools are two three five thousand people right in high school mm. middle school for you wow. to uh, compete or to be on the basketball basketball team is like going to Harvard. So um, I didn't really, that didn't work out for me. And um, I'm not a good runner. And so that was pretty much it. Like high jump, long jump, running track, basketball. And um, mm -hmm. our the space in our school is also very limited. You, you're not going to see a soccer field at a regular school, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I decided to figure something out on my own. Uh, so I started playing hockey and skateboard, you know, skateboarding is also more flexible. I was a street skater, can do it whatever uh, I want, you know, after school. Wow. Yeah. And, and what sort of subjects do they teach you at school in China? Uh, <laughs> everything, but we don't learn is I've never heard of humanity and natural, you know, things like that was so weird, like sociology and, like, what is that? Psychology, none of that. Um, our, we start to fill in on the hardcore subjects. So, for example, um, calculus starts when you're in seventh grade, when you're 13 years old. Whoa. Um, physics, <laughs> chemistry shortly follow, like six months or a year after. So, by the time you're in high school, you're every single day, it's Chinese, math, English, every single day. Uh, and then physics, chemistry, and uh, politics, some science courses uh, every day. So it's very packed. And the, the schedule is from, you know, 8, 8.30 all the way to about 5.30 to 6. So we never heard of a school day that ends at 2.33. And it blows my <laughs> mind. And, wow. and a lot of the kids go to evening schools after that. Good Lord. Have tutors. So, Yeah. So what is politics as a subject? So, um, so actually it's more, I think politics is like, there's world politics, there's, there's history. Um, a lot of that is actually Chinese history. 
And by the way, why did I mention history? It was certainly because Chinese has 5,000 years of history, but it was not a course I, I necessarily enjoyed. Um, I, those are the courses I didn't mention because they didn't matter as much. They were mm. not often uh, treated as, as important compared to the core courses like the math and the physics. So, you know, if you don't do so well, a little bit tough, but it's not a, a, a deal breaker, breaker, you know? Yeah. And, and are those sub, so sorry, Kira, I guess. You go, man. No, I was just going to say, are there, is there a, a specific drive in the country be, for those subjects to grow that as a, because tech and all of that in China is so big, is that like the real drive just to get the youngsters in there early? I think, yes, part partly it's true because at the time you know this again it's 15 20 years ago things are shift changing but not as rapidly as you think uh, when you work as a lawyer as an engineer as a scientist as a doctor it's um, highly respected so those they treat the courses we're talking about as the foundation uh, mm. for those type of careers and um, i think that's that's why and i also I think as you can imagine, thousands of years ago, um, I think this goes to even uh, at you know the Forbidden City, the palace museums, where the emperor and the empresses also highly valued people who possessed those skills. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, at the time, I think there are a lot of the original inventions from China are so focused on science, and that's why I think there's still so much emphasis on science. But now I think these days, to, to be honest, we absolutely realize that we lack knowledge in other areas like sociology, like psychology, mindset. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing a lot more courses, especially online courses, that people are kind of trying to fill in the blanks there. It's super interesting. And I promise this is just the last question on your schooling. <laughs> it's pretty interesting for me. What about writing? Okay, we look at writing like Chinese writing and honestly I mean it, it looks almost impossible to understand or it even looks like art in a way mm -hmm. how do you I mean I guess you're a kid um, you just kind of have to learn it but it seems really difficult is it as difficult as it looks it is it really is and I think English is very tricky um, because it's not very uniform but Chinese characters, you know, when you're a little kid, that's the only thing you know. And I was also born left-handed, but I, since then I've been corrected to be right-handed. The reason was because writing mm -hmm. Chinese characters as a left-handed person, it's near impossible. I went through school knowing one kid who was remained left-handed and he was literally oh, erasing as he was writing. Um, Cause there's so many twists and turns, right? It's like trying to do Kung Fu and, and, uh, <laughs> Is you writing in a different direction as well? Is that why? Why would it? Yeah. It, it's the same direction, but you're literally, you have to be writing this way, right? So, and you turn and um, you can make it work. There are people who are left-handed in China for sure. Um, but to have beautiful handwriting, like you said, it's an art form. I think, I think it was actually originally designed for more right-handed people, like the <laughs> orientation and everything. Um, but yeah, you just learn. I remember thinking when I was five or six, I started learning how to write, I think when I was three or so, my dad was a calligrapher uh, and realizing that it was difficult. But I remember being that age and thinking, well, I'm Chinese. I know most, the rest of the world don't have to do this, but I don't know when I'm still here. So, you know, you have to do what you got to do. <laughs> and funny. so do you write? Uh, English now with your right hand. You're a right yes. hander now. Wow. Yes. Yeah. I, I've been right handed since uh, before I, I attended school. So they basically, my parents converted me or whatever that is uh, when I was like five, five and a half. Um, but I was also going to say that just like English, like when you don't know how to spell a word, what is a good example? Like restaurant. Uh, <laughs> like, you know, when you're in school, you're just like, you know, I'm just going to pretend and make it super messy in the middle and pretend <laughs> that people won't even recognize it. Or -E E-S-T. Oh. <laughs> um, and then in Chinese, it's exactly the same. And <laughs> so all the Chinese characters are what, what we call squares. If you recognize all of them, 
fit into like a perfect square. So within each square, there are quadrants too. So you, if you divide into four parts, it's not always the case. Uh, you can have like one, two, three, four within that. So you can mess up any part of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, I, we all did that. I, wow. I have to do more of that now because my Chinese has declined and um, <laughs> I've gotten here. I, I've seen some of Craig's writing and I reckon oh he writes in Chinese, even though <laughs> he's writing English. <laughs> it's because I'm left-handed and I, I'm, uh, I embrace my smudge on my left hand. So. Oh God. <laughs> uh, it's crazy. <laughs> So, Faye, tell us uh, about um, a little bit about the move to the States and the, what the actual American dream looked like for you and uh, how that all went down. Yeah, I came here, thought that I finally had a chance to be on a hockey team. And my mom asked me, why are you 17? Nothing about going to college. I thought about that too, but I thought it was just like more automatic of a route or a decision but i really want to do that and then just always always wanted to prove something and that's like speaking of personal pressure I, I just don't i don't think i didn't think there was an accurate picture or representation of who these chinese people are who china is and i thought there may be an opportunity um you know, I, now I think about it, it's very Seth Godin, right? People like us do things like this. And I wanted to just influence and penetrate a very small group of people. And that really was my original intention. And going from Beijing to Freiburg, Maine, just so you know, I always thought Maine was part of Canada, but turns out it's part of the US <laughs> and a town of less than 5,000 to 10,000 people in that entire town. So it was... Uh, quite a transition and it was the exactly the type of people i could target <laughs> <laughs> so and you what you came over with your school and i mean how, how what was the plan you were going to be here for just a year was there any sort of you know plan to it yeah so i signed up at the time you have to sign up with an agency you have to give them a call explain who you are you can't personal at the time you couldn't personally apply to a school you have to be affiliated with these educational agencies. So that's how I did it. I was with five to six other kids I had never met before. There were, most of them were from Beijing. So we were on the same flight um, over to Freiburg, Maine. And then you arrive and you, your English then was like kind of okay enough to get you along, was it? Yeah, I think it was okay. <laughs> it, was, it was okay. I, I, my English was considered to be really good in China. I, I remember going to a public school and all the kids asked me to spell this and say that I made up a lot of words and nobody could tell uh, anything just for fun. <laughs> and I realized I couldn't do that anymore. And I realized there's so many things that I, I just didn't know what they meant. Um, slang or, you know, things I never toys that we didn't have. And so, and then, also, there's a lot of uh, sounds that simply just don't exist in Chinese language. And that's the case in you know, Korean and Japanese. And the biggest embarrassment was it didn't occur to me, but I was very much <laughs> there when it happened. This poor Chinese girl, she wants to say I need a sheet on my bed. But... <laughs> <laughs> so, what did she say? <laughs> I need a shit on my bed. <laughs> but it wasn't a joke because the, this, the double E, the long E and the short E just doesn't exist. Yeah. And the, it's same with the, and now I think about it, it's, it's quite messy. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's yeah. funny. I mean, my girlfriend's from Brazil and uh, she had a lot of those sort of uh, words and things that she would say as well to her colleagues when, uh, when she came over. And, and I just admire people that, that have sort of the guts to go overseas and like really put themselves in mm -hmm. like, an uncomfortable situation, you know, especially when, mm -hmm. you, you know, you might, it's not your first language. It's such a difficult thing. And you're 17 years old, yeah. you know, like, you must be pretty proud about what you've done. I think as I'm getting older, I really am. And sometimes you ask yourself, 34, 35, can I do this again? Part of you thinking, I don't think I can. Like, what happened? What let me to do that? 
but when you're in that environment, um, you know, we could only take a certain amount of cash. We're 17 with no way of making money on our own. Uh, you know, you, you have to really just endure and then make the most of it. And, uh, so that was kind of incredible. I recently chatted with someone on a podcast about the fact that playing ice hockey for me at the time meant there was no girls team. I didn't realize that. And the coach asked me if I wanted to play with boys. I said, I do. I, I, I have to check this thing off the list. So that's what it takes. I will do it. But it, it sounds really cool. My dad used to brag about this for like 10 <laughs> years. And, um, but what ended up happening is you share the same locker room you go to all of these places and there's like 25 boys and there's me and <laughs> and 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 it's just you know it comes down to it you're like okay i guess i just have to do this i became <laughs> more strategic over time like wearing like undershirts and shorts and like it just becomes really inconvenient but you know i i definitely admire myself at the plan. time yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So take us to that moment you've moved from this, you know, literally millions of people city to this beautiful small town. Take us to those first few nights you you in this what dormitory in this home. What's going on in your mind? Yeah, first of all, it snowed almost right away in Maine. That's even north of Boston. It just in October very soon it just like snowflakes. You're like what is going on right now? And uh, my, how I was feeling, I was the first few nights, I was so excited. I really was. I was making new friends and everybody, you know, my roommate, I was from Germany and, uh, you know, I just, you have all these pictures. You knew nothing about German people or Germany other than what Mm -hmm. you learned in the textbook, which a lot of it wasn't pretty. And Mm -hmm. so I definitely had some anxiety uh, I, I even told her, she's like, no, <laughs> no we have nothing to do with it. You know, she was, she explained to me the Nazis are not, you know, all these yeah. things. He's actually Austrian. And um, so <laughs> it was very exciting to live in a girl's dorm. And uh, I remember, you know, late at night and you just, you're, it's weird. You're trying to brush your teeth and you look over and these, all these 15 other strangers, like you're just brushing, <laughs> you just want some. <laughs> You know, and uh, and then the, and then I try to um, kind of distract myself and realize, like, wow, look at all these weird toothpastes. We had our <laughs> toothpaste. There are like fifteen other types of and different colors of toothpaste and every language. But and then we start every night. They're like, oh, let's use the Chinese toothpaste tonight. Let's use the yeah. German toothpaste. <laughs> Yeah. That's cool. That's so cool. So how many of you were? There was lots of you in that dorm, hey? Is that right? I think close to, if I have to guess, I think it was maybe 25 to 30 girls. And we all shared rooms. So it was me, my roommate, and it's always always two girls per room. Oh, that's cool. And and so I think like you, you mentioned, your folks are not that traditional. Um, but did you have any pressures ever, like, you know, as cultural pressures, I guess, from maybe um, other people or members of your family at all, because you, you know, you've gone to America and you're kind of living this other life. Yeah. uh, You know, the, the pressure, first of all, we didn't really have like mobile phones at the time. So the communication in a way was exciting and scary because I couldn't just easily call my parents. Mm-hmm. I have to buy a phone card, wait in line. There's one phone on that entire floor. And um, I can't imagine what it's like today. So even if my grandparents really wanted to say something to me, they couldn't. Um, I think the pressure comes from within. And, and, but like you said, Gareth, it is largely influenced by what you, what you learned, what you knew. Uh, one thing that was very puzzling and also challenging to me is what is the right way to be as a Chinese person living in America? And I don't mean American born Chinese, but if you come over here, what is the right behavior? What is unacceptable? Like, what don't you want to do? So for example, one thing I told all the kids is like, do not ever spit on the floor. Don't like, (laughs) not that you, you know, not that anybody did it. Um, you know, but it's something that, you know, it's largely eliminated in China, but at the time, you know, you do see things like let's, we all got to be, we got to behave differently. And I remember, um, there's one girl from, 
the suburbs who is eating in China, if you want to express how much you're enjoying the food, right? You have to make really loud noises. The hosts would love that. But wow. immediately, this this girl, I, I remember having this like, oh, do I tell her? Like people are already thinking, you know, kids could say or do anything at the school or making fun of her a little bit. It's like, do I tell her? How do I approach her? And mm. there are a lot of these decisions you have to make as mm. adults and dealing with conflicts and difficult conversations, right? Trying to do the right thing. So. Mm. Wow. It's so ridiculous in a way that you have to feel that pressure to conform to something that other people have placed upon their idea of what you should be it's like just such a weird thing and but but it's totally real as well you know like to signal uh to others who you are and what you're about your values and your virtues um yeah. and yeah it's just a really sort of interesting thing well what kind of people were you hanging around with who did you gravitate towards so I remember wanting to make friends with everybody and, you know, it's still, I remember there's a cafeteria, huge cafeteria of about, you know, 15 tables, large tables that you could probably put easily 10 kids at each table. And I remember walking in and I would see a group of Chinese kids and for sure a group of Korean kids and nobody can break into that group. And that's, that's the culture and the group and the table of German kids. And, and then there's, you know, and because most of the international students were um, dormitory students, and whereas the day students are more, you know, spread out. So I just made a point. And so I was always sitting at a table where I invited people from all around the world just to sit with us. And um, I wasn't able to convince everybody. And so instead, I just, uh, I remember at times I walk up to other tables and be invited to sit down and yeah, I, it was not easy. I don't think I can, I can do it at this age now, but at the time it was like, I may just be here for nine months or a year. I'm not here mm. to only speak Chinese and only hang out with Chinese students. Um, so. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, maybe, maybe I misunderstood, but you are still doing this today. Like, you know, I see you bringing people together from all around, you know, and if we just talk about our old podcasters uh, catch up every couple of weeks, this is, something that's you created so it's definitely something you're still doing now that's for sure and it's something that's sort of carried on with you it seems i love it i absolutely i love that group not only because of the great podcast and i love bringing people from all around the world and you know as we're all aware of the political climate especially in the u.s today i feel like wow i am I'm destiny to do this. I, you know, above anybody else, because this is what I've always been doing is because people have all these misconceptions with what foreigners are like. And, you know, even though I'm not saying people dislike foreigners, most of them don't, they just feel slightly uncomfortable mm. to perhaps severely uncomfortable. And <laughs> <laughs> so to, you know, to train that, to, to help people, kind of have break in a little bit is through conversations, through food, through something that's so that we as human beings all share, you know, as simple as that toothpaste that uh, I think I was the one who said, I, I, I need, I have to try that toothpaste. It just looks way too cool to, you know, to skip. So I think that you can connect with people on such micro levels uh, that mm. will not come across as being invasive at all. Yeah, for sure. So just, just when you sat down at the cafeteria there and you weren't having like, say, I don't know, your traditional food, what did it feel like to have this American food? And did, did you ever crave for, you know, whatever you <laughs> ate back home? Greasy hamburgers. <laughs> oh my God. I, as a, so it, it's such an interesting part because I was a little bit scared, but also um, my parents always brought a lot of, I, I tried everything, all the Western food that I've tried growing up and mostly because of my mom. So I was way more conditioned and better conditioned than some of the other kids. But still, I have to say, um, so for the international students, we're there at night. Dinner was always kind of fancy. You got some skewers and something that like stir fries and, and that's almost resembling of your whatever you're used to. The problem was lunch because all the day students, American students are part of this whole lunch 
crowd. And I remember even, I remember lining up when I saw grilled cheese for the first time. I'll never forget that moment. <laughs> I, I, I literally, I was looking at it in my head. I was like, what is that? You know? <laughs> no way. Mind? And then the cheese like dripping out, just like, oh, my oh God. it looks so terrible to us. Really, it was <laughs> frightening. And it was no, nothing else. That may be in a, like a hot dog. But I remember all the Chinese kids like, scooch up. I'm like, Faye, what is that? I was like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> so and then you try it. It's like, oh, where have you been all my life? Yeah. <laughs> Faye, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, Garrett, you mentioned um, sort of in-group, art groups, sort of mentality. Um, you know, Gareth and I come from a country that is very diverse, obviously. And I was just wondering, in China, is there is there sort of a uniformity or homogeneity amongst people, or do you also have like, oh, well, they're from a certain class, or they have a, or they're from this area? Is there a bit of that that you you sort of get going on in China? For sure, I think that uh, that is very dominant in most parts of the world. And um, in terms of class, I would I would say. When it comes to ethnicity and you know mm. skin colors, there isn't that big of a variety because still today you would say that most of the people you interact with are still Chinese, even though way way more expats from all over the world in China than we have ever seen before. So there is a bit of that, and I grew up in a sort of middle upper class, not quite upper class, but not quite middle class either. So. You know, we have we have seen people from all walks of life, but I must say that one thing that really trained me and conditioned me to be the way I am today is because my parents uh, have just been phenomenal humans in this regards. That my dad was really high up in the army; um, we could easily make a phone call, and it, that was like my Uber, except for it was entirely free. <laughs> I, you know, if I were late for class, I could just call up someone. Um, you know, really nice cars in general. But my dad, starting with himself, he always took buses. He would take a, he will call a cab. He will pay for it. Huh. And he would never trouble anybody else. My mom is the same way that the people, mm. you know, we had um, uh, help at home. We had, I don't know whether I should call them maids or not, babysitters. And growing up a little bit, but not always, only when, when I first came back, fifth, sixth grade, because my parents didn't know how to raise a kid anymore. And, <laughs> and that was so easy too. And, uh, you know, and also we had people who, are, who were drivers for us occasionally, really became such close family friends. And, but I know that outside of our home, that's usually not the case for them. Um, we invite them to join dinner for us. My parents offer to pay for a lot of things. And yeah. Wow. Interesting. That's interesting. And and so your dad, who was, what did he do in the army? And was he like, what is the army all about, I guess, in China? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, because we were, I, I remember asking my, my, uh, my dad this question, because we're not actively at war, you know, yeah. it's not. Um, so the army does all kinds of things. I don't know if my answer is official, but there's many, there are many, many departments, agriculture, medicine and all that so we had the privilege to when i say growing up uh on an army base and i have no comparison i don't know what the u.s army base is like but you have these gigantic condos apartment buildings and um depending on your rank that determines how big your home is and uh you know and then there's there are gyms there's like a whole you never have to leave the base and you could have lunch and dinner for free and with many options, my parents never took me there because both of them are love cooking. They couldn't. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. I, I, I'm so fascinated by, um, by war and armies and things like that. Not that I love it, but I'm just like, you know, or like I'm pro it. So just fascinated by it. And like the amounts of investments and the facilities that are available. One of my friends, he works for, I think the sort of CIA of the Swedish army. And he often wow. is, goes to like Afghanistan and these sort of things. And he tells me about the air, the, the army bases there, like 
he just says, you cannot believe how huge these things are. And the, he's like, for example, just the gyms. He said, There's, I've never seen gyms like this in the entire world. Yeah. You know, they're just like the most equipment you've ever imagined, like as many weights as you ever want. You walk through like this sort of tunnel and you've got um, fridges on the side and you take what you want. And it's just, it's just incredible the amount of investment and, and what the you know, countries spend on sort of their military. Yeah, and then um, hospitals are right on the base, clinics, um, you know, and they're far, I mean, farms are not on the base, but you could literally drive for an hour or two and go visit where we get all these specialized foods and um, it, it tastes so good. But the funny thing is I, it's hard for me to compare because, give you a side story, my mom spent 37 years working inside the Forbidden City which is, uh, which is, I don't want to compare it to an army base, but which is humongous because it has 9,999 temples or kind of castles mm. within that whole space. And wow. how this relates to living on the army base and the, the amazing food that we get from living there is I get the best food, especially fruits from the Forbidden City that mm. I eat the same fruit as the emperors once ate. Because- wow all very special seeds and very, very, very special treatments for these fruit trees uh, wow. growing up that, you know, if you get a regular, so for example, um, some of my favorite fruits are like uh, peaches are probably like one of my favorites and you get from the supermarket, they usually like about this big or like you get at the Forbidden City, they look like cartoon. They look, you know, it's like oh, eating a grapefruit really. and they're so mm. juicy and they don't go bad for That's some cool. weird reason. And so the, all kinds of persimmons, like any kind of weird fruits that you get from there, it's uh, quite something. But anyway. <laughs> and they would have fed that, they would have been fed to the, to the princesses and the, and the empresses and these kinds of things. Wow. Exactly. And those, my mom could tell you thousands of those stories. Uh, so when they pick the fruits, obviously, they'll just be like, emperor who you go i mean they have to look through you know dozens and dozens and pick them the best one they use it for cooking i i am so i'm so spoiled because most tourists don't even know by going to beijing you don't want to go to just some restaurant you want to visit specific spots where they used to make specialty foods for people who work at the forbidden city especially the emperor and the way they make it is just out of this world. And, but most people have no idea where they are. And it, they're, my mom knows everything like the back of her hand. Yeah, oh, so. That's so cool. It's always good having local knowledge, that's for sure. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> and, and while we're on it, can you just tell me a little bit about the Forbidden City and what it is? Oh, sure. So uh, <laughs> I try to find out how many years ago was this built. I'll, I'll get you some numbers, but they're all over the Wikipedia. So the Forbidden City is basically the home to the uh, numerous generations of the emperors and the empresses, like the kings and queens of China back in the day. The last dynasty is the Qing dynasty. Uh, that's in early 1900, you know, before China you know, became China. And uh, so the Forbidden City now is one of the most popular places for tourists. And it's conveniently adjacent to the Tiananmen Square. So mm. you see basically two squares together. And here's Tiananmen, and then there's the square here. And then you can just walk right through it and just right through the Forbidden City. Um, and Beijing, for those, uh, most people know it's the capital of China. And, um, and then when you look at a map of China, Tiananmen Square and uh, the Forbidden City are like dead center in Beijing. Um, mm. And it, and it's for a lot of weird, weird reasons, you know, feng shui and, and all that. I know it sounds very superstitious. And I know nothing about it. But all the, nat all the natural disasters, earthquake or earthquakes that happen in China, nothing has ever happened in Beijing. Like that's why mm. they, they pick that spot. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, wow. I, I totally got to visit China. It's like right yeah. up there on the list, you know, just places with... Let's so do much. it. Yeah, for yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Faye, um, you obviously um, have worked in the corporate world, but you've also taken a risk and you've gone to work for yourself as a freelancer. 
mm-hmm. and you've done that in the last three years, what kind of motivated you to do that? And like, how did you sort of find the courage to do it as well? I think I was ready when I was 26 or 27. I waited until I was 31 because I needed a green card to do that. Wow. So um, what motivated me was uh, after a few years of working in my mid, mid towards late 20s, I knew I always instinctively, I knew I wasn't interested in climbing the corporate ladder at all. I didn't relate necessarily to those people. And um, it was also, I think it's fair to say that when you look around and you don't really see a lot of Asian executives. Um, And um, so I just didn't really have the desire, always wanted to do my own things. And I actually thought I waited quite long for that to happen. So Mm -hmm. I was emotionally, mentally very ready Uh, What also motivated me was, I think that's a key part, even though it's not often talked about, is ever since I was 23 years old, when I had my first job, I set up my 401k account right away, and I put away between 6-7%, and I think later on to 10% of my earnings, which wasn't very much at all, Mm -hmm. consistently into a 401k account. So by the time I left at the age of 31, I learned what, what compounding means and I Mm -hmm. actually had a lot of leeway a lot of runway to to be able to do this respond you know responsibly so responsibly okay (laughs) 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 and and a a 401k just for like you know other people that are not in America that's savings for pensions or something like that for retirement yes so I know. I, I actually talk about 401k in China. People say, what? Uh, <laughs> so whatever money you put in when you're 23, you can't touch that money until you're 59 and a half. However, if you have life events like, I don't know, getting married, raising a child, college tuition, you can actually take some part of that money out without too much penalty. Mm, nice. Yeah. Okay, cool. And, and so tell us a little bit about like the the differences in sort of the business world in America and China. And, you know, there's this sort of trend towards people being really interested in China itself and as a sort of a business interest for, from the way, from a standpoint of the West. Um, tell us a little bit about that sort of difference and, and, and what the impetus is for people wanting to look to, towards China. So that I can definitely answer that question in, in several ways. So um, because people are, are interested, so um, would I be offering insights to people who want to do business in China or learn more about China in general? Um, how can I be more helpful in that regard? Yes. So f- let's first talk about uh, why do is it interesting to people uh, and uh, is China sort of encouraging that interest? Um, I think China is absolutely encouraging that interest um, just by the sheer number of tourists that you see in China. Years ago, we only see more organized tourists through these four or five major companies, whereas people are now going, you know, complete bag packing their way through China, not just major cities like Beijing and Shanghai. And uh, I see them all the time. And then it's just incredible. I don't, I personally don't know how they do it because certain areas they hit, there's no translation. There's nobody speaking English. Um, but I also think now, as many people know, there's a lot of money in China. There are a lot of young people who have successfully, you know, now fully understand entrepreneurship and, and uh, have been very successful. And some of them have studied abroad some of them are just born and raised in, in China, never left. So I think they are seeking partnerships. And it's not no longer just about for us as in you know, exporting to the US, exporting labor for a cheap price. Now, I actually see trends where China is willing to be, pay big money for you know, people in North America, South America, or you know, Europe to basically come act as consultants um, for, for whatever they're doing. I, I'm thinking a lot about software because that's the industry I'm in, mm. but I see that being, uh, you know, it's happening in many other areas as well. 
And Faye, you, you run your own podcast and we, it would be nice to hear a bit about that podcast and, and what brought it on. And then we can go and talk about, you know, another project, of course, that you're running, that you're helping people spread their podcasts in the world. So yeah, yeah. let's talk about Faye's world. Yeah, let's talk about Face World. So when I started my podcast, I, you know, I turned 30 uh, and I decided that, wow, my green card is still pending. I know I want to run my, do my own business. I didn't start my podcast thinking that will turn into a business. Not at all. I just had this urge of creativity and shipping things and getting things done, making something of my own, even if it doesn't generate a penny. So uh, in October 2014, I launched the show. The first 10, 15 episodes were friends and family, just kind of getting the groove on. No structure, no plan, even though I thought I did. In retrospect, I was like, wow, uh, that wasn't much of a plan at all. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it took me like two weeks to record the intro and still think that I was sounding way too funny um, and, and just weird. And so after... I think shortly after the 15th, the 20th episode, I started to notice a trend where people are reaching out to me, talk about, oh, that's so courageous. I'm so glad you're doing this. Um, I want to do it as well. How do you do it? To very quickly, Ife, thanks for learning so much about me, reading my book right before the interview. And now that I learned that that, that Faye, you are a digital marketer, you're a project manager. Is there any way for us to work together? Is there any way for us to partner on something? So that's really what opened my eyes through authentic connection. And, and so I must give credits to the podcast that, that it became a major uh, motivator to, for me to actually start the company because at some point I realized I have to because I'm taking on all these clients. That's so cool. And, and what is your company now doing? Like you said, you have digital marketing, freelancing and project management. How are you sort of running that? Yeah. So the, the company right now, we are, I, I went from uh, <laughs> Jack sort of basically doing everything for everyone to honing in on, wow, what is my zone of genius? What do I want to do for the next few years at least? So um, I still have uh, the, the service offering, which is given my background as a technologist and project manager, so I can do, I can create websites for people end to end um, from having a conversation, strategy, messaging, the technology piece. Um, I know how to code. I don't do so much of that anymore because as you guys know, it's a waste of time. Um, <laughs> the message comes first. And so I still do that. Um, but I also uh, act as a marketing mentor for people who are, um, you know, especially immigrants and a lot of female, um, a lot of women I work with as well, that they want to start their business that they don't want to be alone or feel alone in doing so. Um, we also produce uh, videos for clients and video storytelling, uh, promotional videos and all that. So there's different branches uh, within the business itself. Um, and I, I realized as I'm talking about this, I didn't actually talk about what the show is about. So the people I'm helping as part of the business is very much the people I go after and trying to represent on Face World Podcast. So I call them the unsung heroes and self-made artists. Um, and um, since then, uh, we realized that there are four to five, there are five to six major categories within that group of people. So in other words, we don't just go after Asian female entrepreneurs and we kind of open up the aperture and, and talk to people like yourselves. We love podcasters and we love entrepreneurs. We love performing uh, artists. So uh, we try to help people navigate and, and relate to different groups of people as well. That's cool. Uh, and you must be seen, I guess, as quite a role model for woman uh, in general but also especially asian women do you, do you actually help mentor a lot of them do you find that you have a lot of them coming to you for help or just advice or something like that there are definitely a good number of them um and but i notice because my show isn't only targeting uh the, the asian population or female only or the combination of both 
uh, there's a pretty big variety. But like you said, I noticed part of the message is particularly resonating to Asian female. And uh, it's at the more meta level of uh, people send me a message to say, hey, I'm a mother of three young children. I've given up my life, my dreams for a while. And you really instilled that confidence in me, sparked something. Right? Like I just drew, you know, I went to an art class the other day and I get these messages all the time. It's not so much of, about commenting the particular story. Um, sometimes it, it is. Uh, as notice when I interviewed a woman who, um, you know, again, have young children and who volunteered to talk about postpartum depression. And so many women of every color, every ethnicity to say, wow, we thought we're bad mothers. I'm so glad we're mm. not alone. Uh, so yeah, I, I love that. I think people who are very shy instead of posting comments on this website, I wish they do more of that. But they all sent me very personalized emails and very mm. long like essay length. Wow. I love reading them and I keep them. So. Yeah. Wow, it must be quite rewarding for you on some level. Yeah, for sure. And and I think it's really interesting for us as podcasters to not see these people as subscribers or downloads. I uh, mm. I actually just imagine it doesn't matter if this episode has, you know, 50 downloads, 300 downloads, 1000 downloads. These are real people listening. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I don't look at the numbers anymore actually. Yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. for for us sense. like you know, we, we kind of just keep an eye on them, of course, but what really drives us are those little messages, you know, someone going, mm -hmm. wow, that was such a cool podcast, you know, I'm really going to look this person up or I didn't think about that. So, wow, it's just, you know, what a tough life and I'm so thankful and grateful for my own life. And it's those little messages for us, which really make us sort of keep on going. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think, I think if there's a way, I, I was just thinking as talking to you guys, I feel like we need to develop a software where we can save and bundle a bunch of emails and have those trickle back in, mm -hmm. you know, it's like a boomerang for Google and it just sending some of these messages back to us to remind us, um, you know, That's I know it doesn't cool. happen right every day, but when we get them, there's the whole adrenaline and it's like, there's a rush, right? You feel like I could just feel it. Um, as we're talking about it. So. Yeah, I guess it, it also comes down to, like you said earlier, Faith, the, the sort of your driving force when you started the podcast, was it a, are you a marketer that wants to market your business or are you someone that actually just wants to have a platform to be able to have those connections? And, and I guess that's why it's so rewarding for, for people like ourselves because our, uh, you know, impetus from the beginning wasn't just to have this you know this vehicle to make money you know so so our reward system is is based on something different which is um yeah which is really cool to have those connections you know yeah absolutely and when you as you guys know so well when you when you do this and uh it changes your relationship with that person forever and at the, I feel like it's at the DNA level almost mm. because <laughs> I remember just like you said, I just want to record these conversations because sometimes otherwise they're, they're long, you know, they're long gone. You have to catch people mm. when they're sort of healthy and happy and, and um, when they're doing exciting things, you know, my dad passed away nearly 10 years ago and who was one of the, you know, most philosophical, smart and like it just, but I didn't have any recordings of him until he was sick. And I don't, I don't feel so inclined to actually listen to them. So um, I realized we have to take that moment and, and distill mm. that. And it's, it, if people cry a little bit, they laugh a little bit and it's just so magical um, when they're willing to let you do that. And what I noticed as I'm traveling around the world, literally when I was in China, somebody I interviewed, who was in Beijing and I was all the way in Southern part of China. He said, Oh, I'm going to be in Hong Kong. Like let's arrange something to happen. And, and then as I'm traveling all around the U S people drive, like I said, an hour and a half and people open up their doors and meet me for the first time. And you see their children right at their homes. You're like, where does the trust come from? 
and and it just it's just incredible you know hmm. tell me about it yeah it's such a nice message and i think it's so important to document people's stories like you know we we miss out on so much stuff and so much good stuff like you you know you missed out on your dad's yeah. a lot of his life i guess by not documenting it and mm. it seems to me like that helping people and being a good person is something that sort of runs through your blood and one of the big things that you're working on now is you helping people expose themselves, their podcasts in particular, to the Chinese market. Mm-hmm. And you've started your own online course uh, that where they can start launching their podcasts on a p- platform called S- Simalaya. Mm-hmm. If I'm right. Yes, yeah. so your Chinese is right on. <laughs> <laughs> and that platform is basically bigger than any platform around the world, you know, or that I think bigger than all the sort of English platforms together mm-hmm. plus more. Mm-hmm. And yeah, do you want to tell us a little bit about that and why it's important or exciting or whatever to get your English podcast into China? Yeah, I, this idea only came about earlier this year in March when I was traveling in China uh, you know, we as entrepreneurs, we look at our skill sets, what we're willing to do, what people are willing to pay for, is there a real market and all of that. It kind of hit me to say, hey, I speak Mandarin Chinese and uh, I have an English podcast. I'm more equipped and, and I'm willing to introduce all these English speaking podcasters to a brand new platform. And, and also because I have so much empathy for people who create and you know it sounds so sexy and put together now wherever you are listening to this show on the train or driving it it takes like blood and tears and heart and soul to to produce something and so i realize i don't want that effort to go you know waste it i think and i want help the listeners to be exposed to more um you know listening's better podcasts real stories so Simalaya came as a natural platform. Number wise, they have, it has 500 million uh, listeners compared to iTunes on average is about 250. Hmm. And hmm. iTunes is worldwide and Simalaya is China only. Um, again, wow. there's, because there's over 1.3 billion Chinese people uh, living in China and there are so many expats who are also waiting to be exposed uh, to news stories. I thought, it came very naturally for for me trying to create a course around it and uh you know i can talk a little bit more about beta testing and this and that but i think my it, the moment i talked to gareth and my old podcasters group i mean i remember gareth is like i'll sign up right now where's the course here's my email and i had nothing at the time so it was a lot of excitement wow and are people looking for that are there are people in china looking for english podcasts or english content so they are and we can prove that because uh, you know gareth was just at, at the podcast movement event i didn't realize that simalaya set up the entire booth and was really trying to be present and engage and attract all these uh clearly american podcasters so the motivation there uh, and to to separate the two um when when Gareth said Himalaya, that's how we say Himalaya in Chinese. So mm. the 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 word starting with X as in Xerox, that's a Chinese version. Very recently this year, they started Himalaya, which is the English version. Now they don't share a database. They also don't share the listeners. Mm. Um, so um, why well, well, I feel like I was a little sidetracked. They want to listen to it because little kids now at the age of apparently six months to a year old start learning English. And so the parents and, and then not just little kids, but also, um, you know, people in school, people have jobs working for, uh, you know, American European companies in China. They're all trying to find resources where, you know, they, they want to improve their English and expats obviously have a slightly different motivation. Um, so, I realized that after searching through Simalaya, the Chinese version, uh, Chinese platform, they're only, they're only ESL podcasts. So English is a second language where they're trying to teach you how to speak the language, but there are no interviews, no stories, nothing. Um, so I think that's why I want, wanted to create the course. 
Yeah, it's very cool. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for doing that because we're actually on there now and we've we've actually only put our first three episodes on it only because I've just been uh, just caught up with other things. But I have a weekend job of starting to put more of them on. That's for sure. And uh, thank you for you know all your help in that. It's uh, it's it's really amazing. You know, it's nice. Just it's just interesting. Like I mean, not that I understand any of the stuff that pops up on my phone, but like each morning I have like stuff pop up, a notification pop up from Sumalai. I'm like, oh, cool. That's a nice reminder. That <laughs> someone in China is probably listening to us. You know, and, nice uh, reminder. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, they uh, just um, I mean, I guess before we finish off, you're working on one other thing, which is really exciting. You're working on a documentary. Mm-hmm. And this documentary, as far as I understand, it's about your life and, you know, things that you're going through and struggles and stuff like that, as, as well as other things. Do you just want to let us know a bit more about that, please? Sure. I've been talking about the documentary and I realize I don't have that perfect pitch yet. <laughs> and I feel like I could share something and the documentary could, could end up to be something else as well. So it is about my journey. The motivation came about when I turned 34, which was last year, uh, 17 times two. My God, I never knew, you know, envision that half of my life in the US and half in China. What a perfect mm-hmm. time to reflect. And so instead of just being a talking head about me and more about me, I realized what changed my life and, and making me the person I am today are the mentors that I found. Um, as a, a young teenager, I, you know, money's limited, connections are limited. So you literally have to seek them out when you live in a foreign country. And so I reach out to Seth Godin. Uh, I, I reach out to the, you know, the people that who have really helped me. Some of them are my clients and, um, and it, all of them are, have been on my podcast, actually with the exception of Seth, who has not yet appeared on the show. So <laughs> uh, it's just incredible to be able to travel to them, sit down in their homes, um, in their offices, at their homes. I want them to pick things up and we're just going to have this very casual conversation, uh, a short interviews with a lot of B-rolls focusing on who they are, uh, and then, you know, the side of their glasses, the shoes they're wearing, and just make it really human and, and really fun. Um, cool. Thank and you. how's that coming along? Oh, my God. It's a project I felt like. It's a monster project. It's like, please do not let it kill me. Uh, <laughs> I am exhausted. I've been feeling exhausted for the past two months, financially, emotionally. And uh, um, so, you know, it's coming up. Things are coming together. Um, I have two amazing, uh, one director, one producer. Uh, both are English. And I was like, how did that happen? Um, <laughs> and they're also, um, they were part, one of them still part of the Blue Men group. Um, and Ooh. yeah, and then it just, I love, I've worked with them before. They are, they're both podcast guests. I guess that's how it happened. Mm-hmm. So I love the fact that now I can, pay them i can pay the my guests to be mm-hmm. working and collaborating with me so like it's a two-way street now i'm super excited that's cool yeah, cool awesome. that's really exciting and it's going to be launched early next year is it what's the early next year we're shooting for spring but i think we're going to go crazy and trying to get a lot done before end of this year and then package the marketing starting next year yeah that's awesome i've seen the sort of uh prequel if that's what it's called i'm not sure but uh, it, it's it looks really good and the quality is great and the sound is is really good as well so i'm excited to watch the whole thing that's for sure so much more is coming gareth i recorded that one in this very office when it was like st- stormy and dark out in boston but uh, we have a cinematic camera i got real people working on this project i'm, I'm so excited it's gonna look great Cool. That's exciting. That's awesome. And so cool, Faye. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming on our podcast as a guest. It's been a delight chatting to you. And what is the best way for our listeners to get in touch with you or to just get in contact to find out about you? Yeah, I try to keep it consistent. Faye's world everywhere, but it's the it's F E I S W O R L D, and that's how. I spell my name in Chinese 
and I am on faceworld.com. I try to be more active on Instagram and uh, Facebook, a little bit on Twitter. So um, where you can email me, Faye at faceworld.com. <laughs> it's so Beautiful. cool. So Faye, just wanted to say a massive thank you. you you've come on here with a, an abundance of energy and a huge <laughs> smile. And that always just makes a podcast so fun and so nice. You know, it's just really easy. It's been really easy to talk to you. And it's been really fascinating hearing about your history. And, you know, thanks for telling us a lot about China too, because, you know, for a lot of us, we're kind of in the dark, I guess. And we, but we're fascinated by it. So thank you for, you know, dropping a few sort of golden nuggets of information there. And I just want to say, well done for everything you've done. You've, you've achieved so much and you really are an inspiration to so many people. And we, I specifically really look up to you and I'm so glad that you have connected with myself and with all these other people and that you sort of bring us all together. And I hope that you carry on doing that in your life because it's a real gift and it's uh, people really sort of, uh, gravitate towards people like yourself and we benefit from people like you that bring people together. So it's a real gift. Thank you very much. Uh, keep on doing it and keep on smiling. Oh, thank you so much, Gareth and <laughs> yeah. Greg. And uh, I want to thank you ahead of time for all the hard work that's coming up for you for editing and, and for an hour and a half that you set through and for your curiosity to listen to my stories and, and all the other people's stories and make us, you know, feel not just important, um, but also in a way, you know, makes our lives more meaningful and exciting. So yeah, I really want to thank you for that and for all your hard work, um, all the amazing work that you've put into podcasting. And I'm on your email list and I just love getting these updates from you. So I encourage people who are listening, if you're not on the email list already, sign up for the newsletter, please. Uh, that's no, that's kind, kind of your thing. Yeah, just briefly from my side, Faye, like you get it pretty well, but you know, you're very, very relatable. And, but at the same time, doing amazing things. And that just, is a message of hope that we can all kind of have a sort of, let's say in inverted commas, a normal life, but still strive to give back. You know, you have a real message of giving back and, and by connecting people, that's what we're all about as well Is like, it's all about people and you can totally just see that your focus is um, that human connection. So, so thanks for that. That's also really inspiring and, you know, we were on our own journeys personally of, of like moving into entrepreneurship uh, and especially like online, like you're doing and, and that kind of thing. And it's just super inspiring just to see like the hard work, but the passion. So, um, yeah, we're just super excited to see where you're heading uh, and we can't wait for that documentary. It's going to be really, really valuable uh, and worth to, to watch just seeing uh, what you've been up to. So thanks so much. Oh, thank you, Craig. And let me know if there's anything I can do to help you and kind of as a, uh, like as a third person to, to maybe help move you along towards the entrepreneurship and, and, and really think about structuring your services or any, any opinions and, and, and help that you need. I would love to be able to do that. I've done that for my clients, but oh, again, you know, with, for you guys, I'll be more than happy to provide the Thanks. help I can. That's kind Thank of you so much. Cool, Faye. Thank you. <laughs> that was Great. such a cool chat. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Awesome chat. <laughs> How did you enjoy that? Waking at dawn, packing the gear, September tour and up in the air. Stop at the toll, digging for change. Snowy Cape Fold Mountain Range. Gotta be quick so far, 